Okay, folks, if you'll turn the book of Zechariah with me, please. Zechariah. Zechariah. He's right before the last book in the Old Testament. Zechariah. You remember I've told you so many times before that these Hebrew names are, are loaded with meaning. Zechariah means remembered of Jehovah. Raya. You see the name ending in ah. You've got a Jehovah attached to the end of it. Uh, Hananiah is Jehovah attached to the end of it, end of it, and Zechariah, Zechariah, remembered of Jehovah. Uh, let's place him chronologically so we'll begin to understand what we're dealing with here now. The book of Revelation is the last book of the canon of Scripture, period, and that's written, written approximately 90 to 95 A.D. by the Apostle John. Now, the book of Zechariah predates Revelation by hundreds of years because the book of Zechariah is written before Christ and it is written before the completed canon of Scripture of the Old Testament and the book of Malachi we normally date approximately 400 B.C. So this places the book of Zechariah somewhere in the range of uh, 350 to 400 B.C. So we're talking about a span of 500 years from the writing of Zechariah and the writing of Revelation. Now, some books were written after Malachi which closed the Old Testament canon of Scripture. And these books are what we call the Apocrypha. You've heard me mention them many times. The Apocrypha uh, fits in between the period, which we call 400 silent years, the period of Malachi and Matthew. During that period of time, the Apocrypha. Now, you have to be a little more specific. This is the Jewish Apocrypha. And these are the books like First and Second Maccabees, Bell and the Dragon, Tobit, Judith, and so forth. These, are the, these, these books are the Jewish Apocrypha. They have prophecies in them. They have some wild stuff in them. And I want you to understand that we never have appealed to them one time. The Lord Jesus Christ never appealed to them one time for authority for anything. But the book of Zechariah has some wild stuff in it too. The difference is that Zechariah is canonical scripture. And Revelation is canonical scripture. And Tobit and Bell and the Dragon and Judith and the rest of them aren't. The book of Zechariah has some powerful statements, and we're going to deal with them this morning and try to get them in context. Remember, Zechariah is written when Israel has been in captivity for 70 years and is going back to rebuild their temple and their walls. So after the 70 years of captivity, when Israel is starting to go back, and the going back of Israel to rebuild Jerusalem is a process. It's not a one-time event. It's a drawn-out process. Zerubbabel is the one who rebuilds the temple. He's mentioned in the book of Zechariah. Uh, the book of, uh, of uh, Ezra is uh, referring to the priesthood being restored. For Ezra is the one who restores the priesthood. That's very important with Israel. Because uh, the priesthood of Israel is according to the genealogy. And anyone couldn't just stand up and proclaim to be a priest. He had to be born of the tribe of Aaron. He had to be a Levite, be, uh, of the tribe of Levi, of the sons of Aaron. <clears throat> and he couldn't be a priest. So we're dealing with the restoration of the priesthood, the restoration of the temple, and the restoration of the city itself. The book of Zechariah deals with all aspects. It deals with the priesthood, it deals with the city, and it deals with the temple. But the book of Zechariah not only deals with these aspects of the, of the restoration, it looks far forward into the future and talks about the Antichrist. It talks about the second coming of Christ. It talks about the judgments when he comes to this earth. It talks about the battle of Armageddon. The book of Zechariah not only deals with the first restoration of Israel to their land, it deals with the second coming of Christ and the second restoration of Israel to their land. A key passage in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 11, says this. I will stretch forth my hand the second time to restore Israel. Now think about this. Big deal. They have been restored one time. There's no question about that. They were brought back to their land. They were put into the land by the decree of Cyrus. God moved the heart of a Gentile king and sent his people home. But they were scattered again. 
The second scattering took place by, of all people, Rome. And the Roman Empire scattered the Jews to the end of the earth. They're in what's called the Diaspora today. But they will be returned, restored the second time. That's the key. This is where the post anomalous messes up completely. He puts all of the prophecies relating to the restoration of Israel in the first restoration of the Old Testament. And he can't look past that and see a second restoration. But Isaiah chapter number 11 says very clearly, referring to this millennium, he said, I will stretch forth my hand the second time. If you'd like to turn there, it's 11th chapter, I don't remember exactly the verse. Isaiah chapter number 11. This is one of those key scriptures. Uh, Isaiah chapter number 11. Here it is, verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day, and notice the wording, that day, in that day, in that day, and 99 times out of 100, reference to that day is a reference to the day of the Lord. It's come to pass in that day that the Lord, capital Jehovah, shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, Egypt, Pathras, so forth and so on. That's the key. <coughs> that key that unlocks the mystery of the restoration of Israel. Now, if that's true, and it is, then we should look for Israel to be restored the second time, shouldn't we? That's exactly what's been taking place. They've been restored. Now, that's the key also that unlocks Zechariah. Zechariah refers to the first restoration and the second restoration. The book of Zechariah is referring to the first restoration and the second restoration, sometimes in the same sentence. So if you'll understand it in that context, you'll begin to see what we're dealing with. Now I'm going to show you some passages in Zechariah that plainly tells us that there is a past and future to its prophecies. Look at chapter number 9 and verse 9. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly, and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now, who's this? I'm absolutely. We, this is, we've been taught this from day one, and it's absolutely correct. Matthew quotes it. The New Testament writers quote this passage. Now, wait a minute here. Zechariah is written 400 years before Christ, so this must be a prophecy of the future, right? It certainly is. But this is not a restoration. This is the coming of the king to be rejected. They reject their king. If you'll look at uh, chapter number uh, uh, 12 and verse 10. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. The scripture says, And I will pour upon the house of David, the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. Now what's that? That's the crucifixion. And that's a remarkable prophecy, too, because the Jews executed by stoning. But what are they talking about? They're talking about the crucifixion of the Savior. They're talking about the, the putting to death of the, uh, of the Son of God. Now, in chapter number, uh, chapter number 11 and verse number 16, here's a prophecy of the Antichrist. Look carefully. Zechariah chapter 11 and verse 16. For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land who shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still. These are all the duties of a real shepherd. He won't do this because he's not a real shepherd. And he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces, just like Hophni and Phinehas did in the uh, Old Testament, the sons of uh, of uh, the priest who died because he was so heavy in the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. Now, if there's any doubt in your mind, look carefully at the spelling. Zechariah 11 and verse 17. Woe to the idle shepherd. He was idle in verse number 16 because he didn't do what he was supposed to do, see? He wasn't fulfilling his responsibilities. He's an idle shepherd. But the play on words, look at the play on words. He's not only idle in the sense that he doesn't do what he's supposed to do, but how's the word spelled? I-D-O-L. 
How do you spell idle in the sense that you're not doing anything? Exactly, the spelling's different. Oh, this is a mistranslation then, preacher. No, it's the Bible trying to tell us something. He's an idol. He's something that's set up in the stead of God. That's what any idol is. Any idol, care what it is, it's set in the place of God. They set it in the place of God. They worship that thing instead of the Lord. That's what an idol is. So the Antichrist, and that's exactly who we're dealing with here, comes on the scene as a shepherd carrying a staff with a miter with all the implements of being a shepherd and yet he is the idol, I-D-O-L. Now I've said before many, many, many times, Revelation chapter number 13, the Antichrist takes two forms. What are they? Secular and religious. Secular and religious. Secular and religious. Remember 1 John? The Apostle John says there are many, what in the world today? Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist has been here for 2,000 years. Many people have had that spirit. No question about that. What is the spirit of Antichrist? He's not only against Christ, anti, anti-Christ, against Christ, but he is anti in the sense that he is set over against Christ in contradistinction to him. There's a difference between the two of them. Jesus Christ and the Antichrist are absolutely, diametrically, completely opposed. There is nothing about them the same. Jesus Christ on one hand, the Antichrist on the other hand, are as different as night and day. So why can't people tell the difference today? Who is it today that carries a staff in his hand calls him the good, calls himself the shepherd? I mean, after all, the, the scripture begins to come together for us if we'll just take it for what it says. The idle shepherd. All right, now let's look at the text. Go back to chapter number 1. Here we have this prophecy, and we'll have, a, we'll have a running thing through here. Zechariah moves. It's kind of like the Gospel of Mark. Zechariah starts, and it just moves. It doesn't, you, don't, you, you don't get bored reading this book. In Zechariah chapter number, of course, I don't, that came out wrong, didn't it? You should never get bored reading any Bible. But so-and-so begets so-and-so, who begets so-and-so, who begets so-and-so. You know, sometimes you can, you can read the begets until you've begotten to death, but they're still in there for a reason, aren't they? You're tracing genealogies. You're establishing authority. You're establishing government, priesthood, and so forth. The book of Zechariah is a fast-moving book. In Zechariah chapter number 1 and verse number 8, watch carefully. I saw by night, and a man riding upon a red horse, he stood among the myrtle trees that was in the bottom, and behind him was there red horses, speckled in white. Then said I, O my Lord, what are these? And the angel that talked with me said to me, I will show thee what these be. And then in verse number 11, they answered the angel of the Lord that stood among the myrtle trees and said, We have walked to and fro through the earth, and behold, all the earth sitteth still and is at rest. That sets the time element. It's a time of peace. Now who's going to come on the scene declaring peace? Peace. The message today is not the grace of God that bringeth salvation that hath appeared to all men. The message today is peace, peace, peace. And Jesus Christ said, when they shall say peace and safety, then what? Sudden destruction. And how does the destruction come? Suddenly. Everything, the idea is that everything looks good, and it appears as if maybe the Scripture's wrong here. I mean, after all, we can bring in the millennium. Can't we bring an era of peace? If we can just get the gospel out and get men under the dominance of the church, we can bring the world into peace. No, you can't. You've got to change the heart. And the issue is the heart, not the outward. But here in, Re in Zechariah chapter number 1, we set the time element. We have messengers. Verse 11, these messengers have gone to and fro on the earth. They're reconnoitering. They're gathering information, intelligence. These people are like the CIA. They're coming back to report to God. Now chapter number 1 and verse 18, it says this, Then lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said to the angel that talked with me, What be these? He answered me, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Well, now let's get the time element. Zechariah prophesies, first of all, of the first restoration of Israel because they're, in scattered, they're, they're scattered when this book is written. He's talking about the first restoration of Israel, but he's also looking far past that to the second restoration of Israel. So these are the nations that scattered them. We can go back in antiquity and name them very clearly. Let's get the context. Israel is at peace. They've been scattered and God is going to restore his people, and nothing is going to stop him. Chapter 2 and verse 1. I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. What's he going to measure? Verse 2, Jerusalem. 
He's not the only one that measures Jerusalem. If you look at Zechariah, rather Revelation chapter number 11, you'll find them measuring the temple. If you look at the book of Ezekiel, you'll find them measuring Israel again. You'll find Israel laid out in, 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 in a pattern. Israel is so holy, and every spot on that land, in that land, so holy that God has designated it to a certain uh, azimuth, uh, geometrical design, parameters, and whatever. It's not like any other land on earth. Every spot of the land of Israel is going to be preeminent in the millennium. He's going to restore it. He wants to measure it. He wants, to, wants them to understand, this is my town. I'm going to come back and I'm going to restore this town. Look at verse 5. For I saith, for I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. So the Lord is going to come back and he's going to restore Israel. This is the first coming now. This, not coming, first restoration we're dealing with. Verse 11. And many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people, and I will dwell in the midst of thee. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto thee. And the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the Holy Land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. That's not the first restoration. That's the second restoration. But notice the Lord has a portion in it. It is such a holy land that the Lord has designated a certain spot that belongs to him. It's his portion. So we have the first restoration and the second restoration in one chapter. Now hold on a minute. Look at chapter 3 and verse 1. He showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. Now listen carefully. Before the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the ethics and morality and spirituality of this earth was bound up in one people. One people on this earth had the light. They had the oracles of God. Do you know who that people? Do you know who these people were? It was exactly. It was Israel. To them was given the oracles of the law, of, of the word of God, the promises. You remember we taught on this this past Wednesday night. All of this was through Abraham and his seed. The stars of the heaven represented the Gentiles. The sand of the seashore represented the Jew. The earth is the Jew's earthly inheritance. All right? All of it was bound up in these people, the Jew. Now look at this. We're coming down to the second coming. We are approaching the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is no wonder that once again, morality, spirituality, and the truth is pointing back again to what people. You know as well as I do, most churches you send people to, you're sending them straight to hell. When they're in that church and they're preaching Sophia, they're preaching this business of, of uh, lesbianism from the pulpit, they're preaching a situation ethics to people, preaching be feel good, if it feels good, do it. They're not preaching the gospel of Christ. Where in the world are they going and where are they going to take people with them? They're going to hell. The church is an abomination. Only a remnant is left in the church today, and that remnant is the, those who are going to be raptured for probably uh, 50 million people in this country who profess to be Christians. By the grace of God, you might find five million or ten million who are truly saved, born again by the grace. And that's a good, that'd be a good percentage if that's the case. And I'm not even sure it's that big. But I'm, there's a lot of people out there that love the Lord, no doubt about it. But there's a whole lot more that don't. They go to church every single Sunday. So this business is tied up with Israel. Look at it. Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. The devil knew exactly where to be. Exactly. He knew exactly where to be. He was going to resist Joshua because Joshua represented the righteousness of Israel. And Satan knew that if he could destroy that, then he would destroy their purpose in being. Israel was the light of the world in the Old Testament. Israel was the, very, was the one that led people to God. That's where God dwelt among Israel in the Old Testament. Now where does he dwell today? He dwells in the church of God. You're, a, you're a, a, a spiritual house. All you little temples join together, create a big temple. And he comes in and dwells in the midst of that. For the glory of God, he dwells in, in the midst of his people. But when he goes, when the church is raptured out of this world, where then? What's the first thing that shows up in Revelation chapter number 7 after the church is gone in Revelation 5? What's the first thing that shows up? 144,000 from the what? Now, if you're a post or nominalist, you despise doctrine like that because you're teaching people that God is finished with a Jew once and for all and forever. 
You're telling people that the Jew is a pariah, that he's accursed, that he's a Christ killer, and God's done with him, and he's wiped him off the face of the earth, and he's, he's worthy for nothing but death. And folks, that stuff's been preached from the pulpit for millennium. And he's not. Jesus Christ was a Jew, came into his own, his own received him not. They are that natural root, Romans chapter 11, and they are going to be, Zechariah chapter number 11, elevated again to a place of supremacy. This is Joshua, the high priest, standing before the Lord. See, He's, this is not Christ, this is Joshua. This is not Jesus Christ. I've heard some people say this is the Lord Jesus. This is not him. This is Joshua. And he's standing, he's a type of him, yes, but he's not the Son of God. And he's standing and Satan at his right hand to resist him. And he is resisting because Satan knows exactly where to fight. He knows exactly what to do. And he tries to stop what's going to happen, but he can't do it. The Lord has to cleanse, Zechariah, cleanse uh, Joshua. Once he cleanses him, he's able to restore his people. He restores them in holiness. The, the reason that Israel exists is because they represent God and his people, the apple of his eye, holiness on this earth, holiness unto the Lord. And so God restores Israel. But here's the devil there to, to uh, resist him. Now look at verse number 8. Now watch this thing as it changes. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. Now, we've shifted entirely. Who's this? Exactly. He's the Lord Jesus Christ and he's the branch. Now notice, we've got the first restoration. Here's Joshua, represents the righteousness of Israel. He's restored. Satan's there to stand against him. But God looks past Joshua and looks into the future, and he says, my servant, the branch, is coming. Now who's he going to stand for? What's his righteousness? Who gets the benefit of that? Who gets the benefit of the new covenant? We're receiving the benefit of it right now under the sense of the New Testament. Every one of us today born again because of the New Testament. This is the blood of the New Testament. This is the bread of the New Testament. We benefit from that. But who's he talking about in Hebrews chapter number 8 when he says the house of Judah and the house of Israel? You better believe he is. They're going to receive the benefit of the new covenant. And this is the branch. Verse number 8, I will bring forth my servant the branch. The servant of the Lord, Isaiah chapter number 42, the servant of the Lord, the branch. First restoration, second restoration. It gets interesting now. Look at verse number 10. Zechariah chapter number 3 and verse number 10. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. Now here's what's happened. Zechariah is given as a prophecy of those people who are alive right then and tells them they're going to be restored, Jehovah's going to fight for them, and he's going to bring them right back into the land, build their temple, build their city, and restore their priesthood. That's what jo uh, Joshua represents. But he looks past that and prophesies of a future event. He's trying to use what happened to Israel as an object lesson to them. He's saying, look, You've been in captivity for 70 years. I'm bringing you back into your land. I'm putting you where you should have been. You should have, you should have stayed there, but because of rebellion, you left. I'm putting you back in your land. But let me tell you something. What's happened to you is just a prefigure of what's going to happen again to you. You still haven't learned your lesson. You're going to be scattered again. You're going to be scattered to the ends of the earth again. And this next time when I restore you, it won't be Joshua being cleansed. It'll be the branch, my servant. It's going to take the branch. It's going to take one that you don't know yet. It's going to take one that you've never seen. Nobody's ever seen him. It's going to take one that must come forth by his own righteousness. And he, my servant, will restore you to this land. And when he brings you in this next time, he's going to build his own temple. You'll not build it for him. It even says this later in Zechariah. He's going to build his own temple, his own righteousness in his land, and establish you as my people once again in this land. Object lesson. Learn that from Zechariah. Now watch this thing begin to tie in with Revelation. Look at Zechariah chapter number 4 and verse 1. Taking longer than I'd thought. 
chapter 4 and verse 1, the angel that talked with me came again and said, and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said to me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and the seven lamps thereon, and the seven pipes, the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, the other upon the left side thereof. Here's a vision. Now what is all this about olive trees? I mean, what, how do we make sense of stuff like this? Well, let the Bible interpret itself. Uh, look at verse number 3. Two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, the other upon the left side. I said, what are these, my Lord? Verse number 4. All right, look at verse number 12. I answered again and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? He answered and said to me, Knowest thou not what these be? So many times the Lord answers a question with a question because it's incredulous. The Lord says, you should know the answer. See? Verse number 13. Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, no, my Lord, I don't know. Verse 14. Then said he, these are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, where do we read that in the New Testament? Exactly. Let's go over there. Where is it, brother? 11. Revelation chapter number 11. Now, who do we have here in Revelation chapter number 11? We have two, what are they called? Witnesses. Now, we'll argue from now till the Lord comes about who they are. But we've got two witnesses here, right? Now, look carefully. Revelation chapter number 11, verse 4. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth. See the wording? Now that's remarkable coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> well, it's not a coincidence. A coincidence simply means that something else showed up, but, uh, you know, by random, here it is. This is not the issue. This book is pre-planned. Do you believe that? you believe the one who wrote it knew what he was doing? Everything set in here, he had a reason for saying it. The two olive branches that stand by the God of the whole earth. They're showing up when Israel, having measured the temple, verse number 1, chapter number 11, a measuring of the temple, these two show up. What are their purposes? What's their purpose? What do they do? Who do they confront personally? They, they confront the Antichrist. I mean, they confront him. They don't just get up and preach about him. They confront him. And what we're dealing with here then is there is God sending his witnesses. Well, he's not, they're not here to preach to the Antichrist to get him saved. So who are they witnessing to? Israel, exactly. This is the witness of God and the sign that God sends to the Jew. The Bible says the Jew seeketh the what? And the Greeks seek after wisdom. Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, the rest of them. The Jew requires a sign. God started his dealings with the Jew on account of a sign. He started with a sign. And what was the final sign the Lord Jesus Christ gave the Jew? And he said, you'll reject it. Pardon? I mean the sign. What did he say to them? And as, uh, as Jonah was, oh, did you say Jonah? Okay, that's it. I didn't understand you. That's the sign. And what is the sign of Jonah? Exactly. So the last sign he left them before he left this earth was... As Jonah was three days and three nights in the, heart of, in, the, in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man be, and that's it, the resurrection. That's the sign. All right, so he, the Jew requires a sign. Did he give them a sign? He certainly did. They rejected the sign. They said someone stole his body. They paid great sums, the leaders of Israel did, to say that someone stole his body. You see how it goes? All right, now let's watch this thing carefully. In the fourth chapter of Zechariah, we have the two olive branches. Chapter number 5, we have the intervention of wickedness. Here's the demonic forces. In verse number 1, I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a what? That could just as well be a flying saucer. That could be some kind of an unidentified flying object. UFO. What's a UFO? A UFO was born, created in hell. What is a UFO? It is nothing in the world more than a deception of the devil as one more scenario that he's going to use today to either explain away the rapture or prepare people to receive, which is probably both, 
this onslaught of angels again from outer space. The angels come in and the Christians go out. And so he's got them both tied up in that, UFOs. And there's a big interest in that today. What is this thing? What is it? It's a flying scroll, flying roll. What is it? Well, nobody knows. They don't have the slightest idea. It's an object. But look at verse number 5. Lift up thy eyes and see what is that goeth forth. I said, what is it? He said, this is an ephah that goeth forth. He said to me, their resemblance throughout all the earth. Verse number 7. This is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the ephah. This is wickedness. Who is this woman? You'll find her over here in Revelation chapter number 17. A woman seated upon a scarlet colored beast. Who is the woman? Well, let's tie her in. Look at verse 11. She's in the land of what? Well, Babylon is the place, but it's called Shinar because that's the ancient term. See, it was the land of Shinar before it became the city of Babylon. When the children of Noah came off of that ark and went down into the land of Shinar, and then they build the city of Babylon. And it was named Babylon because of the confusion of the languages. First it was Shinar, then Babylon. All right. What religion originated in Babylon? The what? That astrology originated there. Yes, it did. Pardon? Yes, it did. It certainly did. That's where it started. All right. Now in chapter number 6. Of all things, we have four horsemen show up. I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from beneath between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. The first chariot were red horses, the second chariot black horses, the third chariot white horses, and the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. Now, where in the, in the New Testament do we find a red horse, white horse, black horse, and a pale horse? Chapter number 6 of Revelation. The only difference is the grizzled and bay horse with a pale horse. And there's not really any difference. Have you ever seen anybody dying and seen them turn gray? Have you ever seen a green cast come over their face? That's exactly what he's saying. That is a grizzled bay horse, a grayish green cast that comes over the face. Revelation chapter number 6, there's a red horse, black horse, white horse, and a gray green cast. You have an identical match. Now watch carefully. Then I answered verse 4 and said to the angel, talk with me, what are these? He's... he's, he's dumbfounded. The angel answered said to me, These are the four spirits of the heavens which go forth from standing before the Lord of the, all the earth. Now who sent them forth then? God did. Who sent the lion spirit into the mouth of the prophets of Ahab? God did. Look carefully. In verse number 6, the black horses which are therein go forth into the where? North country. The white go forth and into the where? South country. Now what does the black represent? In Revelation chapter number 6. What's the white horse? Start with the white one. Who's on it? All right. He goes forth conquering to conquer. He hath a bow. Has, what's he missing? <clears throat> missing the arrow. All right, now who is he? He's not Christ, is he? Well, a lot of preachers are preaching that it's Christ. But he's not Christ. So we have the Antichrist showing up on a white horse. Revelation 19, verse 11, The heavens open, behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He had many crowns. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, a name written that no man knows, but he himself. His name is called the Word of God. You've got a white horse. Then you've got a red horse. Now what's red represent? War, fighting, bloodshed, okay? Then you've got a black horse. 
Okay, then you've got a pale horse. All right, look at what it says. The black horses which are there and go forth into the north country. So it's telling you that what goes into the north. Exactly, see, I mean, compare them. The white go forth after them and the grizzles go forth into the south. If you can take Zechariah and Daniel, the 11th chapter of Daniel, you can work out the, uh, a lot of the, of the specific workings of the Antichrist during the tribulation, and I believe the tribulation saints will do that. I believe they'll take the 11th chapter of Daniel, and they'll take this book of Zechariah, and they can chart what the Antichrist is going to do as far as, God, as, as revealed in Scripture. It's not for us today, because we can't, we, how are you going to figure this out? But they'll know. They'll know. You see, God has His Word for every generation, for every group of believers. He has the Word and the truth for them. For the truth, the, for us today in the age of grace, for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Is that right? For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's correct. We also know that Israel is blinded, and we know they're set in abeyance, and we know the church of God is the vehicle that God gets the truth to the world through. We're the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. We know that. But we also know that the dispensation of the grace of God, which as Paul said is given to him, that he was given as a mystery that he revealed to man, is going to come to an end. And when the dispensation of the grace of God comes to an end, we know that the tribulation period is going to come immediately on the heels of that, and things change. It's no longer the church then that's the vehicle of the truth. The church is gone. So who then becomes the vehicle of the truth? Israel, 144,000 male Jewish virgins are anointed with God, of God, marked with the seal of God, sealed and marked, and they go forth to the ends of the earth to preach the word of God, all right? These people, therefore, will have a Bible, which is this Bible, that they can pick up and read and preach from, and they can surely identify the Antichrist. When he shows up, he's got to meet the criteria in this book. So they've got it for their generation. You follow me on that? All right, we're out, we're out of time. And we made it through the sixth chapter of Zechariah. We'll pick up next week and carry on through. And then put it together. And you begin to see. Now, that gives the Old Testament an altogether different view than a lot of people like to give it, don't they? A lot of people like to call the Old Testament the Old Bible. Like there's a new Bible. You ever heard that before? The old Bible, and a lot of people say that innocently, I'm sure, because they've heard somebody else say it. There is no such thing as an old Bible and a new Bible. The Bible was not complete until John wrote Revelation. And when he wrote Revelation, he finished the one Bible. One book, 66 books. When he wrote the last word in Revelation, the Bible was complete. Until then, it was not complete. There is no such thing as an old Bible and a new Bible. There's one Bible. And it's all the Word of God. Let's have word prayer and we'll let you go.